It's time to build a keyboard interface for the Hack Computer documented on page 90 of the Elements of Computing Systems. Before I do that, though, I recommend that you watch the video that Ben Eater did on how a PS2 keyboard interface works, because that is the interface that I'd like to build. And Mr. Eater does a fantastic job describing the theory of operation. I'm going to just dive in and sort of start with the, d the discussion of how to construct it. So let's get started. Well, let's start by creating our keyboard interface. And our keyboard interface needs to start out with some ins and outs. And so let's put some pins in. And the next one we'll call KBD clock. From the perspective of the hack computer, all it really wants is the output. So let's go ahead and add that as well, because that's what's coming out of this. And this will be 8 bits, even though the interface requires 16. We'll be addressing that a little bit later. For us to interpret anything off of the keyboard, we need to take the keyboard's clock, and we need to take the keyboard's data signal. And what do we do with them? Well, uh, as demonstrated by Mr. Eater, this really all centers around a shift register, being able to take this serial data uh, that comes in from these pins and shift it into a parallel form that allows us to work with it. So let's create some shift registers. A scan code that comes in off the keyboard interface is an 11-bit uh, code. So let's make that 11 bits. And also, if you'll recall, the clock is a uh, negative going clock. So we need the trigger to be on the falling edge for this shift register. And we can already hook some of these together. Let's do that. Right, so the clock from the keyboard is going to be driving the clock of the shift register. And the data from the keyboard will be feeding the shift register. Like so. Now it takes one or more scan codes from the keyboard to translate into a given uh, ASCII character. It depends upon the you know, sequence of keys we're talking about. If it's just a straight letter, then one scan code will do it. But if you're, for example, trying to do, uh, let's say, an ampersand, so that would be shift two, uh, it's going to take obviously more than one of these scan codes in order to figure out that that's what you actually mean in order to present an ampersand, the ASCII value for an ampersand over here. But for now, to keep this simple, we're just going to play with one of these shift registers and try to get that working and then add on to the complexity to interrogate more than one of these scan codes at a time. So there is this notion of having valid data for a scan code. And so I suggest let's create a module to do that validation for us. So a scan code validator is going to take obviously the scan code And that's going to be an 11-bit scan code. And it's going to take the keyboard clock. And it'll become maybe more evident why, it would, why we would need that here, but bear with me. 
And it also, I think, would be useful to have the notion of a reset for this component. And again, it will be obvious why a little bit. And then the only thing that this needs to output is whether or not the scan code is valid. So let's put a pin out here called valid. What is it that makes a scan code valid? The, the most significant bit is always on and the least significant bit is always off. So that's a good and easy place to start. So let's put a splitter out here. And it's a very easy thing to do to wire that up with an AND gate. So the least significant bit has to be always off. So let's wire that this way. And then the most significant bit always has to be on. So second thing is I remember uh, the notion of parity. So there's a parity bit, which is this, this next bit here, bit nine, in combination with all the other bits in the scan code have to form odd parity, meaning there has to be an odd count of bits turned on uh, in order for odd parity to pass. So we need an odd parity checker, I guess. So let's build a component that computes uh, whether nine bit odd parity passes. So let's do this. Odd parity, how do we compute that? Well, first of all, we need our input And we're already going to assume that this has been chopped off uh, with only what we consider to be the thing to compute the parity against. So that'll be nine bits. Remember, it's an eight bit as it's a it's an eight bit value. However, the ninth bit is the parity bit. We need to count whether these whether the number of bits in here turned on is odd or not. How can we do that? Well, if we think about the logic gates at our disposal, one gate that comes to mind is the exclusive OR. So let's drag this exclusive OR gate out here. And let's split our bits. Okay, so let's think about an exclusive OR. What does it do? This output goes high when either this is high or this is high, but not both. So by definition, you are getting an output from this OR gate when uh, two of its inputs have a one totaling an odd number, right? Because if both are zero, there's not that's not an odd number. And so... A zero here and a zero here is going to yield zero here. If both of these are turned on, well, this is an exclusive gate, so that means you're going to get a zero here as well, because, so, you know, two being turned on, that's an even number. But if, if that one's turned on, or that one's turned on, well, then that's, that, the count of the number of turned on is odd, and therefore you should get an odd out of here. So first thing we can do quite easily is to just put an exclusive OR gate on all these pairs. So what do we do with the parity bit? Well, we'll deal with that in just a second. So now, what do we do with these? Well, we can apply the same logic, can't we? So if we take these two and we run them through an exclusive OR gate, isn't the output going to be whether or not we have an odd count? I think it will. We can just cascade it again, can we not? 
Last but not least, we have the parody bit all by its lonesome. So we can, I believe, cascade it one more time. Yielding whether or not we have odd parity, an odd count. Okay, let's test this. Okay, so the number is odd. I'm going to turn the next one on. And the number is even, and so we get false, which is correct. So I'm going to turn this parity bit on. So three, three is our count, and we get a one. Of course, any of these other bits should also apply. So, yeah, looks to me like that works as we expect. So let's now insert this into our, our scan code validator. So our parity checker needs to be hooked up to all of our data bits plus our, our parity bits. So let's put a splitter in to do that. And then this just becomes another item to add to our AND gate. So let's expand the, the size of our AND gate. Just like that. So now that forms the basis of the, valid uh, the validation of the scan code. But there's one more important detail that we need to account for. And that is, this should only be checked if we've shifted in 11 bits, right? Uh, it, it might seem like that this, the, the point in time that's going to be valid is when that has occurred. But that's not really true. If you... Shift in a bunch of random bits and you check this valid indicator, you're going to see that it comes on valid even though you haven't shifted in 11 bits. Implement that test with a counter. And so this counter is going to need to count up to 10, right? Because it's zero based. So we want the number of data bits to, that only needs to be four because we need, you know, to be able to count up to 10 at most. And the maximum value of it will be A, which is 10 hex. We're always going to enable this to be countable. So let's set the enable pin to true. And it will be counting based upon the clock. So we need, let's put some tunnels here. When this counter gets to the end, what do we want it to do? Well, we actually just want it to stop. So when this counter um, gets to 11, that's by, that is the time that it's contributing its knowledge to our logic over here that, hey, yeah, I got 11 bits, so do with that information as you see fit. So what I'm going to propose then is that we just hook up the carry to the AND gate because that's when, that's, that is telling the logic that, yes, I have 11 bits, Go ahead and validate. So let's make this four. And also realize that that moves all of our connection points.
Uh, fix another detail. Uh, we'll always just want this to count up. Now, when do we want this counter to reset? Well, it would make sense that uh, after we get a valid scan code, that the counter would then presumably reset, right? But also notice that we have this reset here. So what I would want to have happen then is when this becomes valid or we have reset, then reset our counter. So let's implement that. So let's hook up our validator to our keyboard. Now it's a little bit awkward. All of these bottom pins are a parallel output from this shift register. However, not this blue pin here. It's actually this pin. And then this becomes the input to our scan code validator. And then of course we need the clock. So let's go ahead and add that. So once we have a valid scan code, uh, what do we do? A scan code and an ASCII code, those are not the same thing. Uh, there's a translation that has to occur here. So let's take a look at some examples. So as we can see, we've got the sampling of scan codes. This list is incomplete, obviously. So here are potential PS2 keyboard scan codes. And here are the letters that some of them can represent. And then here are our ASCII values that translate into either a capital Z or a lowercase z given this scan code. Now, the way uppercase and lowercase is determined is looking at additional scan codes that the keyboard sends because it sends the shift key uh, and caps lock and so forth uh, that you would have to interpret sort of together in order to be able to determine which is which. It's worth noting that upper lowercase characters in the ASCII character set are uh, 32 away from each other. So uh, to get from this number uh, to this number, you would just add 32 or vice versa, subtract 32. But to just keep things simple, uh, how what is the what is the way that we can map a code like this to a code like this? Well, an easy way to do that is with a ROM. This is the address into the ROM, and then this would be the data value coming out of the ROM. First thing is that we're going to need this in several places. I want to build a scan code extractor component to just peel out the eight bits from this shift register. So let's do that. So this will make peeling our scan code out of here a bit easier. So we just need to now map our scan code to a ROM. And it's already eight bits for us, which is convenient. And so it may just be tempting then to do that, but that is not exactly right. And the reason that that's not right is because it does not take our valid indicator into account. It'll just select whatever bits happen to be sitting in the shift register and you know every single keyboard tick, it will look up whatever happens to map to the ROM, which is obviously not correct. So a, way, a simple way to do this is to use a multiplexer to map to our valid indicator
And instead of mapping directly from the scan code, what we'll do is we'll only map the scan code whenever we have a valid, uh, whenever there is a valid scan code. Like that. Otherwise, we're just going to send a zero, which that's what the specification says anyway, is if there's no key, you just send a zero. So let's test this. Uh, first of all, in order to test it, we need to hook a clock up. So I'm just going to do this here because we're going to run this simulation and we're going to kind of step through it. So I'm going to back that off and I'm just going to wire a clock directly. Now one thing to keep in mind is that the keyboard clock is a negative going clock. So I think to achieve that in simulation we're just going to invert the clock. And then uh, we need some test data. So I happen to look some of this data up. So our capital Z ASCII is equal to hex 59. And the scan code for the Z character is equal to 1a so then the binary or we should let's do 11 bit binary scan code will then be so they all have to start with a 1 and then we have a parity bit so I'll put an x cuz I don't know what that's going to be yet and then since the scan code is 1A, so the first four uh, bits will be 0001, and then the next one would be A, which is 10, which is 1010, right? Because this would be 8, and then this bit is the 2 bit, so that's 10. And then the final bit has to be a 0, right? So how many of these ones do we have to make up our scan code? Well, we have three of them, right? So our parity bit doesn't need to be a one. It needs to be a zero because we already have an odd count. So to send, to simulate sending the Z character on the keyboard, this is the scan code that we need to feed in. Now, finally, that needs to get translated to ASCII code 59 because that's what we want to come out from the ROM. So we need 1A to be filled with 59. So over on our ROM, we need 59 there. Okay, let's test this. So it is a little bit tedious to test this in Logisim, but so bear with me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed these bits in one at a time, clicking the advance, uh, and then we will watch what happens here. And of course, I have to um, I have to feed them in least significant bit to most significant bit because that is the order of how the keyboard would actually do it. So, I'm going to clock in the first two zeros. And then I'm going to clock in this one right here. And you'll notice that that just got clocked in. Now I'm going to clock in a zero. And then two ones. And then four zeros. And everything is still quiet over here, which makes sense.
And then finally, a 1. Okay, so this should match this. And it looks like it does. And in fact, we have our ROM. So, so we have our scan code validator with a valid indicator being turned on, which makes sense because we've, we have a valid scan code that we've entered. And we have the scan code extractor routing the 1A scan code to the ROM, to the address of the ROM, and then the ROM translating that to the ASCII code of the Z character, which is 59, and outputting 59 on the data value. So very, very rudimentarily, this forms the basis of our keyboard component. Thanks for watching.